When I was 14, I had a strange encounter that still puzzles me to this day. On the weekends, I'd sometimes go to my mother's place. My parents had divorced. The house she lived on was converted into several small apartments. It was a creepy old farmhouse. The house was at least 150, maybe 200 years old. My mom told me off and on of strange sounds that she had been hearing and seeing things in the corner of her eyes, feelings of being watched. This one particular evening, I spent the night I brought my N64 because my mom would go to bed early and I'd still be up for a few more hours. I still remember to this day what game I was playing, WWF No Mercy. I was sitting Indian style on the floor playing the story mode. I just finished a mission in the game and set down the controller to the left of me, behind me. Directly behind me was a recliner. I'll never forget what I saw next. I went to grab the controller and saw what appeared to be a hoof, like a horse next to the controller on the floor. Insects and blood were coming out of the silver that separated the hoof. I thought to myself, how strange. I slowly glanced up and this demonic figure was staring back at me. It leaned towards me, its face got down on my face and grinned the most evil smile. The eyes black, face red, one winged creature. Blood was dripping from its teeth. It was so surreal, I immediately went into a panic attack and blacked out. I learned later it was the fight or flight response. Several seconds later I came to, laying on the floor. I could barely move. The, de the demonic figure was in the chair, laughing at me. It was as if my fear and energy had been sucked dry from me. I lost all strength. I did all I could to crawl to my mom's room and woke her up. After I woke her up, we talked and she believed me. She told me that she too had seen the same thing earlier that week, but didn't want to scare me. I don't want to make of it all and still think of it to this day. I've no doubt about demons and angels are real, and believe me, the last thing you ever want to encounter is a demon smiling in your face. When I was around two to five years old, my family used to live in a small apartment. We moved in our new home when my mom got pregnant. When we lived in the apartment, I didn't have a lot of friends since there were no kids my age living in the neighborhood. There was no nursery in my small town, and obviously I wasn't old enough to go to school yet. So I used to play by myself and with my good friend, Joe Bet. His name is relevant for later. The problem is, I was the only one who could see and speak with Joe, and Joe was a grown-up man. We used to play with my Hot Wheels and we talked together. My mum would sometimes hear me have a conversation alone in my bedroom and come by and check who I was talking to, but could not see anyone in the room. Every time I asked, I answered, with my friend Joe. Up to this point, it would have been a pretty normal situation for a lonely kid to get an imaginary friend, and I would have thought that myself too if that had stopped there. But the things got a bit stranger when my parents bought a house and planned to move out. I remember some of my Hot Wheels moving alone and some of my toys getting in the living room when we were not home. My mum also told me recently that she started to feel weird in my room at that time, like someone was watching her. My dad doesn't remember anything weird except some of my toys getting out of my room when we were not home, but as he said, he wasn't home often with his work, so we may have missed some clues. We moved to our new home and everything stopped. At first my mom assumed that my entry into kindergarten and me making friends was the reason why I didn't need Joe anymore. But the plot got even weirder. The other family who rented the apartment got in touch with my mom and started asking her questions about the apartment, and more precisely about my bedroom. Their son has got the same bedroom that I had, and like me, he started playing and talking alone in his bedroom. When his parents asked him who he was speaking to, he also answered, Joe. My mom told me that I did the same and answered the same when she questioned me about it. The only difference was his last name. I would always tell to my mom that his name is Joe Bet, and the other kid named him Joe Blow. In both cases, his name was Joe and his surname started with a B. It's a fairly strange coincidence if it is one. I still can't figure out exactly what was happening by that time. And if it was in fact a ghost or entity, or only just two lonely kids with a lot of imagination. At least Joe was a good guy and helped me get through my childhood. For context, I'll try to describe what our floor looks like in the jail. There's an elevator bay with a big metal door that is controlled by motor and chain. This is what we call the main or main slider. All traffic comes into the floor from this door. You go down a small passage and then you're in a space that is the shape of a square with a smaller square room inside called the cube, which is surrounded by seven pods for inmates. Each pod has 12 cells and can fit two inmates. 
The cube is used for controlling doors and basically is an office space where paperwork can be filled out and where you can sit and watch the pods during a shift. I'm assigned night shift on a floor of non-violent inmates gen pop. Typical inmate you'd find on this floor would be drug users, dealers, petty theft and the occasional drunkard kind of deal. I was working this floor by myself and the night was starting off as usual. I show up, lock down all the pods for the night, conduct my head counts and go back to the cube. An hour later I conduct my hourly block check. Everyone's sleeping or was chilling so I return to the cube. Not the second I finish sitting down I hear the sound of someone kicking a cell door. I get up and I start using my flashlight through the pods and eventually narrow it down to B pod 6 cell. One inmate is frantically screaming that his cellmate is coughing up blood and is shaken. I open the door, remove the inmate and see that his cellmate is foaming from his mouth and is performing what is known as an agonal breathing. Essentially, we are listening to him take his final breaths. Long story short, medical gets called and he's eventually taken to hospital, but he doesn't make it to the hospital and is declared dead en route. Come to find out the inmate had swallowed heroin before he was booked and one of the packages ruptured while he was in the jail. It was unfortunate, yes, but it's not the first time it's happened and surely won't be the last I file the paperwork and continued about life as normal. As another thing for context, we have cameras in the individual cell blocks and cells we went back and watched the footage of the incident to confirm there wasn't any kind of assault or general rough housing that would have caused the packages to rupture. The next night I'm assigned the same floor. Similar process comes and goes. Show up, lock down the pods, conduct counts, etc. Hour goes by, I do my standard check, go back to the cube. Again, as I go to sit, I hear three loud bangs coming from what sounds like B-pod again. I go in, I flash my lights, everyone is sleeping or chilling. I return to the cube, three more bangs this time, I refer to my touch screen to see if the kicking is tripping the lock sensor in the door. Sure enough, B-Pod 6 cell is showing that it has been messed with. The cell was still locked down due to the events of the line before, so no inmates should have been in the cell. I go to the cell, open it and double check to make sure nothing and no one is in the cell. No one is in the cell. My next thought is that the lock is malfunctioning. I exit the cell and walk to the cube to call for maintenance. And as I'm on the phone, the door slams shut, which sends me back out to look. At this point, I'm at a loss for words and have no clue what to do. All the inmates of the pod are also trying to figure out what is going on in their pod. And I'm trying to answer their questions, but genuinely, I have no clue what to tell them. It eventually goes quiet. Maintenance arrives. I have them check the lock. Nothing in terms of it being a mechanical malfunction. After that night, I asked my watch supervisor to be placed on a different floor, which at the time we had just got a new batch of rookies in, so he gave me my choice of the floors. I've been on my floor for a little over two years now, and I still have things happen that I can't explain, such as audible footsteps from around the cube, the occasional tapping on the glass of the door to the cube, but nothing as drastic as that night in 2018. <laughs> My mother and her wife bought a big house in a small village in southern Sweden when I was younger. That's the house I grew up in. I never believed in ghosts or anything like that when I was younger, but that was about to change. I lived alone on the first floor of the house because it was only had one bedroom on the entire floor. It was a big house and the rest of the first floor was a TV room, laundry and a big inventory. I have stories for days about that house that I will only tell you the most scary one, in my opinion. This encounter took place on spring, when I was in the ninth grade in high school. I always stood up, stayed up late at night watching MTV in the big TV room downstairs because I didn't care so much about school since it was going to end in a few weeks and I'd done all my tests. One night when I was watching the replay of Jersey Shore, which aired at 3am in Sweden, I heard someone walking down the stairs. I thought it was my mom that was coming down to tell me to go to sleep, as usual. So I quickly laid down to fake sleep on the couch so I could blame the noises coming from the TV on that. But the footsteps didn't come closer. Instead I heard it go up again. After the steps came to the top of the stairs, it went down again. This repeated itself many times, so I went to check on who was walking the stairs up and down. To my surprise, I didn't see anyone walking the stairs, but the steps continued. I thought to myself, now I've lost it. I stood there beside the stairs and followed the footsteps up and down with my eyes. I thought I was hearing things that wasn't there because I didn't sleep much at the time. So I went to the couch, fell asleep, and I didn't think about it too much. When the alarm rang at 7.30, I went up to get some breakfast with my mom and brother. She asked me why I was scared my brother at night by walking so much in the stairs. I explained to her that I 
saw that night, but my mother, skeptic as she always was, angry at me because she didn't believe me. A few years went by, I had some more scary encounters, but she always blamed it on the wind or that it was an old house. I moved out of the house to study in a different city about an hour away from my hometown. Almost a year after I moved, I came home to celebrate my grandmother's birthday. On that occasion, my mother pulled me to the side and said, you've always said there's someone else living in our house. How do you make someone like that disappear? I saw in her eyes that she was frightened, so I asked her what had happened. She explained that the night before, she and my younger sibling slept downstairs because it was really hot upstairs. She woke up because it sounded like there was an intruder in the upstairs kitchen. She said she froze and couldn't move because she was so scared and prayed that the intruder wouldn't go downstairs. The sounds from the kitchen started at 3am and stopped somewhere between 3 and 4am. When she went to the kitchen in the morning, nothing was moved or changed. I told my mother, I told you so, all these years and you never believed me. She said she was sorry and asked me where to go from here. I told her I had no clue, but that the house needs to be cleansed. She hired a medium and I can honestly say that the energy in that house has now changed. My old friends who had no idea that the house was ever haunted or that a medium cleansed it even said something felt different about the house. I lived and grew up in a haunted house but it made me who I am and I don't regret a thing because now I know ghosts are real. A few years ago, my mum and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had been sort of scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we'd been around the fire for a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and looked up. Two people walking out in front of each other, dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, didn't acknowledge me or my mom whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Both had no lights, were barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching heart drop feeling when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on the edge of the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought it was paranormal, he said it was pretty damn sure. Got the hell out of there as soon as I could. I was a dumb fuck as a kid. I did a lot of ridiculous shit, but this encounter, just let me tell you, I learned my lesson about breaking into places that really should be left alone. I was in the middle of the summer, me and my friends sat on a wooden fence smoking cigarettes thinking about what the hell to do with ourselves. One of my friends suggested an abandoned hospital up the road from my house. We were unsure at first as we'd heard a lot of stories from people who had previously went years ago before it was boarded up again. After much discussion, we went. It was boarded up with wood nailed to the windows, the doors were sealed shut so there was no way we could have gotten in that way. We were going to walk away and just go home, but luckily I remembered I had something at home that I could get the boards off with. As we climbed through the window we finally got in, it was like going through a time warp. The place wasn't heavily damaged and the interior looked like it was from the 70s or 60s. There were still stale bloody towels there too, it was eerie as hell. Anyways, we fooled around, freaked each other out for a few hours until we had to go. Before we left, we fucked around with a fire extinguisher that had been left there. While everyone was in the centre of the hospital, I stepped out for a breather in the hallway, with the window we entered through. I was at the bottom of the hallway and I saw a pale, slender figure in a blue hospital gown climb out of the window while looking at me. He looked tired and sick. I froze and screamed. I left as soon as it happened. I will never forget how freaky it was.
So let me start off by saying that I'm a huge horror movie fan and I've seen all major horror movies out there. I pretty much only ever watch horrors in my spare time and like watching anything paranormal. I find it very hard to be genuinely scared and most horrors don't really scare me. So I was looking for a decent horror movie to watch and I'm mostly into demonic paranormal horrors. I came across a movie called The Dark and the Wicked. I looked it up on IMDb and it had a fairly good rating so I thought I'd give it a try. I started watching it around 1am and after I finished watching it, I was like, fuck, that was a really scary movie. This doesn't happen often and it freaked me out a bit. My wife was sleeping and I quietly got into bed because I didn't want to wake her up, but she woke up anyway. She asked me what time it was and it was almost 3am at that point. I told her I watched a really scary movie and it freaked me out. She pretty much told me to shut the fuck up and go to sleep. She can't watch or listen to anything remotely scary. It's been like 20 minutes or so I'm in bed, trying to sleep, and all of a sudden I hear an alarm go off. Initially I was thinking it was coming from my neighbour's house, but then it sounded closer. My wife woke up and she said it could be the car alarm. I looked outside and it wasn't the car, so I thought I'd go downstairs to check it out. The fire alarm was going off. So I put the light on and went to the kitchen and there was no smoke. I went into the living room and there was no smoke. All the appliances were off. I didn't think much of it, so I turned the alarm off and went back into bed. I told my wife and we didn't make anything of it. I tried to go back to sleep again and it must have been around 30 minutes or so and I heard the fire alarm go off again. I did the same thing, looked all around the house, no smoke, all appliances were off. I did not have any explanation of it. I took the fire alarm off the ceiling and checked that the battery was low and this was one of the reasons why it would go off. This particular fire alarm you can't change the battery. It had an expiry date and it ended in 2028. I didn't put the fire alarm back on the ceiling and threw it in the bin. I went back to bed and needless to say my wife was pissed. She was like, I always tell you not to watch these types of movies at night. We're Muslim and she thinks that if you watch movies with demonic shit in it, it can bring negative energy to the house. I thought that was bullshit but after that day I have second thoughts. I'm still going to watch horror movies. I just find it crazy how we've lived in this house for three years now and nothing like that has ever happened before. It could just be a coincidence but it made me think. I've had friends who have told me that similar things have happened to them in the past. Many of you paranormal enthusiasts may have already heard by the now the word Nahul. No mistaking with Nahul, which is a native people here in Mexico. And I would guess that on also some other countries in Latin America, we call that way to people who can shapeshift into animals. Well, it was a cold night. I remember because it was really odd around that zone of the country. My parents' house is in a small town, and back in the day, it was one of the last houses on the outsides of town, so not many neighbors, but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard where we used to have sheep, and on one side, a small water stream, and trees to the side. Suddenly, the sheep started to bleat very loud, something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on the window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly. And smoothing his voice, he told to my mom, go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. There were four brothers, my grandfather and my father. When everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell what he saw. In the barnyard, we had 10 sheep. At the moment my father gave a look, all of them were heaped just in one corner. At the centre, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense. But he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one of the sheep there. The one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep inside of the house and keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. Mal air in Spanish. So he made some kind of prayer, holding his machete. On his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. They went outside. My grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, Go away, you have nothing to do here, leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, like eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming by the way. And when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and rise its head up towards my family. This being was only staring at them, not a single noise, also not red or shining eyes. Only the shadow looked it looked like it was looking at them. 
So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock he picked up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation, but apparently this being was not that strong. Or maybe because on our side were six men armed with machetes. But when the rock hit it, this being turned his back and ran away into the forest, running on four legs like an animal would do. This was when they came close to the sheep. They saw how the sheep on the ground was still alive, but completely unskinned. It was horrifying to say the least. My grandfather sacrificed it to stop the suffering. After that night, a family friend who was known for being quite an old man, but still working on heavy farm labor, even heavier than young men, and that used to practice sorcery to heal people, told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was in Nahul. He told us he'd spoken to the man and asked him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar like that. Up. I want to share this experience that happened to me around 15 years ago, when I started studying in a town away from my parents' home. There was one man, let's call him Tony, who was a good friend of my father. He helped him at work sometimes, hence I hanged out with them usually. When I was 17, I moved to a bigger city to start university, so I travelled every two months to visit my parents for long weekends or vacations. After my second year away, this friend, Tony, died from alcohol abuse. My father told me on a phone call how that happened, or at least how he heard it happened. Around two months later, on Dia de Muertos, Day of the Death here in Mexico, I went to visit my parents, also to go and visit the tombs of the family as the tradition goes. And at this point, I literally forgot about Tony's death. The apparition comes around because I didn't catch the bus that arrives during the day to my parents' hometown, so I was forced to take one that arrives there at like 2am. It's quite a small town, so since I didn't find any taxi near the bus station, I decided to walk home. Around five blocks away from the house, I had to pass on a bridge where people say that a decapitated donkey spirit scares people during the night. I was a bit scared, to be honest. But then, suddenly this friend, Tony, reached me on his bike. I didn't mention that he always moved on a bike, and asked me if I was just arriving from university. Maybe because I was originally thinking about the decapitated donkey, I completely forgot about the fact that Tony was supposed to be dead. So I started to talk to him, and he walked passing the bridge in a couple more blocks for around four or five minutes, talking about the school, the food in the other cities, stuff like that. Just one block away from my parents' house, he just told me, okay, I have to check some things over here, pointing in another direction, but keep safe, say hello to your father for me. We said goodbye and then I got home. Since it was early morning, I walked directly into my room and waited until the next day to go and see my parents. It wasn't until the next morning, when I was just about to tell my father about Tony, that I remembered that he was already dead. At that moment, I didn't tell my parents, but a bit later in the day, my father told me he saw me arriving. He asked me if I was drunk or something because he saw me talking to nobody. So then I told him. I think it was some kind of company on that bridge that I was afraid of because of the stories, and also because of that scare from the donkey story. I didn't even pay attention to the fact that my company was someone I knew was already dead. It is kind of funny for me, and actually never felt afraid in the moments. So thanks to that old friend that, that, that was there with me, even after death. I suddenly awoke in the middle of the night, and there was a face with huge black eyes right in front of mine. I definitely didn't look human, and it didn't show any expression, almost mask-like. It also seemed to look at me at the same time, past me. It's kind of hard to describe. Because it was extremely dark, I tried to rationalize that what I was seeing must be my friend's cat. I remember that she once told me that a cat would often stare very closely at her face when she's hungry and wants food. I thought the huge eyes were simply the cat's face being too close to mine. Because I wanted it to move away from my face, I started to stroke it, just like I would do to a cat, and said Fiora, which is the name of my friend's cat. I could feel my hand touching it, but instead of fur, it felt like I was touching a person's skin. That's when I started to realize something wasn't right. My friend who tends to wake from the slightest bit of noise and who thankfully happened to be awake at that same time, replied, Fiora isn't here. The thing's face moved away from mine and I realized that the eyes remained big. I sat up abruptly and became scared as I noticed that it wasn't my friend's cat. I then saw it move behind my friend's head and on top of a pillow. 
I told her to look at her pillow, still hoping that my friend, my mind is playing tricks on me and that it's just the cat. My friend sat up, stared at her pillow. I can still see that thing sitting there, but she didn't see anything. I started to panic and asked her to quickly switch on the light, but that's when the thing disappeared. I insisted that we look around the room. The doors and windows were closed, so nothing could have entered or left the room, but I firmly wanted to hold on to the belief that it must have been the cat. We obviously found nothing, and my friend began to worry, as I was really panicking at that point. I tried to process what happened, and was so confused by the fact that I was stroking someone moments ago. Sleep paralysis usually means being unable to move, and feeling the sensation of being touched, or having some weight on top of you, but this was the opposite. I could move freely, didn't feel any pressure on top of me, but I could touch the thing, and it felt like it was physically there. Has anyone else experienced something like this? Edit. I want to further describe the appearance of this thing as many of you have asked what it looked like. It's really hard to describe, but I'll try my best. The face was a bit smaller than that of an average adult human head. The eyes were about 6 centimeters in height and a bit longer in width. I described them as black, but they also had a thin, dark grey iris, about 3 millimeters in diameter, and large pupils. The eyes were slightly popping out of its head. It had a very small mouth, no hair on its head, and no ears. The skin was a muddy greyish colour and also covered with a few brown stripes. Once it moved to my friend's pillow, I saw that it didn't have a neck, but a thin body that was only about a metre long. The body itself had a pitch black colour and it walked on four legs. A couple of weeks ago, I had a dream in which I was back at my parents' house and somebody knocked on the door. My grandpa, who's long gone for at least 10 years, went to get it, opened it, stood there, asked something that sounded like drum, and then suddenly like in a freaking jump scene, a woman appeared right in front of me, tall, pale, long black hair, dead eyes, an inch away from my face, and that's when I woke up. What's even weirder, this dream happened two more times, to the point where I was able to recognize what my granddad said, and it was something along the lines of Daruma. I then googled it and I was creeped out when I found out about Daruma Sam Gakuranda, a Japanese game for kids, which is basically a hide and seek, but instead of seeking for your friends, you hide and a summoned ghost is looking for you. The creepiest thing about it is that neither me nor my granddad had anything to do with Japan. I've never heard or read about this subject before, but it gets worse. A week or so later, after the third and so far last episode, I've experienced something that I've later googled as night terror. I was sleeping and I woke up unexpectedly, feeling like somebody's arms were wrapping around my torso and arms and not letting go of me. I also felt like drowning and coughing, and the aforementioned kids game is also associated with falling, drowning, and also called a bathtub game. I jumped out of bed and only then I stopped feeling it. Up until that point it felt so real, it's impossible to describe and for my brain to comprehend. I still can't believe how real and creepy that felt, but it gets even worse. The reason I decided to write this post is that while I'm dressing for the shower today, I've noticed three scratches on my right forearm. I don't recall hurting myself, banging on anything, or scratching against anything, and it only started hurting when I noticed it. I've always believed in the paranormal, in UFOs, possessions, etc. But I also never thought something as random as this would happen, like why something I've never ever heard of appears in my dream several times, and then the extremely real night terror that happened a few days later is connected to it. Like, I was babysitting my nephew, who at the time was one and a half years old, a very active kid. You can't lose sight of him or you'll find him stuck in the oven. It was three in the afternoon and he always takes a little nap at that time, so I left him in his bed and closed the door. I went to the bathroom and when I came out I noticed that the door was open and I thought that he'd already woke up and he was making a mess in the living room. I called him and he answered me from the kitchen. I ran there and he was standing over the dining table. It's an old square wooden table, about 85 centimeters high, and my nephew was easily a few inches shorter. There were only four wooden chairs and they were turned over on the table. I put them that way to prevent him from using them to get on there. The chairs are heavy, even for me it's a bit difficult to put them like that. If he tried to move them alone, they could fall on top of him and hurt him. There is no way that he can move that chair alone without them falling on him or the chairs falling to the floor. And there's no chance that he would get on the table by himself. 
But there he was, standing in the middle of the table, with the four chairs turned over around him as I had left them. He wasn't even scared, he just saw me and told me, Totti, Totti. I asked him how he got up the table. I carried him and he kept saying, Totti, Totti. I thought for a moment that this was some toy that he was looking for, and then I asked him, what's Totti, where is Totti? And he turned and points to a corner in the kitchen, where there was no one or anything. I froze for a moment, and the first thing I thought was, is there someone in the house? Someone broke in, and I put him on the table? No way, that doesn't make any sense. But either way, I grabbed my nephew, I took him to his room again, I checked the kitchen, the living room, the rooms, and nothing. There was no one in the whole house, besides us two. I didn't want to think about the situation anymore. I just felt relieved that my nephew was fine, that he hadn't hurt himself in his little mischief. But I kept wondering, how did he get on that table? When my sister came, I asked her which toy he called Totty, and she told me that it's not a toy, that apparently was some like imaginary friend that my nephew had, and that he'd been talking and playing for like a week with him. I honestly hadn't planned to tell him what happened. I didn't want to get into trouble with her. I knew she would blame me and accuse me of leaving my nephew alone. But when she told me what it was, Totty, I told her everything. I didn't want to rush to think that it was something paranormal. I just told her how weird the whole situation has been, and she just told me, you know how Joe's way is. He managed somehow to find a way to get on the table. That's why I always ask you to keep an eye on him. He might have hurt himself. And I thought, okay, she was right. I kept taking care of him, but I was starting to get a little nervous because I always saw and heard him playing with Totty. And one day I got a lot of courage and I asked him, where's Totty? And he takes my hand, leads me to the kitchen and points to the same corner that he pointed out before. I freaked out for a moment, did my best to keep myself together and later that day, I waited for my sister and asked my nephew the same question, and he did the same thing. Took me to the kitchen and kept pointing to the same place. For me, that wasn't normal. That was really creepy, to be honest. But my sister told me to just stop asking him about Totty. If I keep doing it, I only feed his fantasy, and that it wasn't good for him. So I just did what she told me, and I never asked about it again. After that, I started to have this weird feeling that someone else was there with us. But I just ended up ignoring the situation. I didn't want to suggest it to myself, so I took my sister's attitude and didn't think about it anymore. I convinced myself that it was nothing paranormal, it was just a child's imagination. He kept playing with Totty for a while longer, until he grew up and didn't mention him again. That was about two years ago, and every time I remember that, I still wonder who was Totty, and how he got on the table by himself. Mm -hmm.